Thank you for joining us today on Salon Sluice. My name is Leslie and my co-host is Melissa. I want to remind all of you who listen to us on a regular basis, or maybe this is your first time, to please follow, subscribe, like, share, whatever the case may be for the platform you are on. Now, we do post these episodes on YouTube with video for those of you who'd rather watch. We enjoy making these shows, but unless you interact with us, we're not sure if you do. So please jump on your social media and let us know. You can find us under Salon Sluice on almost any platform. Now, we hope you enjoy today's show. Thank you. Are we going to be reindeer today? Sure, let's be reindeer today. Okay. I like your little background. That's cute. Mm. Hello, Salon Sleuth fans and Leslie. How are you? I'm doing great. How are well, you? I missed you. I missed you last week. And I listened today in the car to the interview with Alex and Chase. And I just want to And I made it very confusing because I did not do a lead up to that. And I did write about that in the uh, description, but for those who don't read the descriptions, like my co-host, Melissa, um, it is just a follow-up from an episode two ago, basically about another podcast called We Ain't Broke. And um, Alex is a, well, Chase is my friend, Alex is my new friend. And um, basically I just interviewed them about their own podcast and what they're doing and who they are. And um, that is what the podcast is like a follow-up to a previous one, but I didn't, I didn't explain that ahead of time. So people brand new coming in have probably have no idea what we're talking about. And hopefully it made started to make sense towards the end, but if you didn't, it was just to um, kind of promote their podcast, which I think what they're doing is amazing. And it's going to help a lot of people with similar situations, I think. Well, and just, just to kind of piggyback on what you're saying, sorry, I'm moving myself here. Never mind technical difficulties. Um, just to piggyback on what you're saying, um, Leslie had spoken about her friend, Janie and how she had inspired executive polish and she, um, left this world way too soon. And wait, I thought it was chase was her son. Is it Alex? Alex is the one in the wheelchair. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. So Chase is Janie's son. And so it was kind of reconnecting with the adult um, that you had known as a child, right? And kind of how he's turning out. And clearly um, he's gotten a really, a lot of great things from his mother and um, he's had a hard life, but he's like, oh my gosh, those boys were so mature. And they're clearly just, I shouldn't call them boys because they're men. Right. But they're just they're just dealing with it. And I love, you guys talked about being authentic and, um, you know, just saying it real and, you know, this is how I'm feeling and some days are going to be positive and some days aren't. And, you know, I thought they just had really great attitudes, but the part that just freaked me out is I was driving (laughs) when I was listening and you started talking about this dress that you had gotten that Janie had gotten for your daughter and how your daughter never actually wore it. And you had like this stream of consciousness, like, oh my God, I just realized the reason I have that dress is so that, um, Chase's daughter can have that dress when he has it. And I thought Chase's like Chase just agreed with that so easily. Like, oh, I thought he was had, had a baby coming soon and, or he had one. Right. And then I called you and I'm like, oh my God, I just got full body chills. When you start talking about that, like literally down to my toes. And you're like, no, no, he's not pregnant. He doesn't have a baby on the way. I'm like, what? Oh yeah. my God. Okay. It was a really weird moment. It, it, it all occurred to me when I was thinking about that living Bible that I had to have. Yeah. And then I realized all along, it wasn't mine. I had to give it to somebody else. And I knew exactly who it was when I met her. And kind of just like when I was telling him the story, and as you know, I was how I normally do. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> like this. And that's what I was doing to them the whole time. But um, it was so strange because it immediately I thought of that moment. And then I thought, oh my God, that dress wasn't mine ever. It wasn't even my dress. And the funny thing is, there's a few times in my life where I feel like um, that has happened where I remember something else 
because it needs, it's almost like when you talk to a medium and they see um, an actor in their vision of like Richard Gere and it's not Richard Gere, but it might be the name Richard. And so then they're like, oh, do you know somebody named Richard? Because that medium had a vision of Richard Gere, right? Right. So I feel like I am given these like moments of remember this because that's going to apply to this. And so like once, um, and this is just another example of this happening. And uh, I, we were all sleeping. It's like four in the morning and a drunk driver hits our retaining wall out front. And we go outside and I tell my, and it is our living, our wall is destroyed. There is bricks like all the way across our yard and the car left. He left like, and I was like, okay, I go, I wonder if his license plate is here. And Michael's like, why would their license plate be here? Well, at that moment, I remembered there was a kid in Lake Oswego who hit a girl, a little girl walking home. And they found out who he was quicker than what would have been faster because his license plate fell off. So in that moment, I was like, I remember that story. And so I was like, I bet it was here. I pick up a brick and there's his license plate. And Michael was like, no way. And I was like, okay. So I feel like there's been a few times where I'm like given this other moment to remember this moment. Wow. And, so I felt like, and as I was like going through that whole story, I was like, that wasn't even my dress. Yeah. You I, had I like exactly this whole... where it is. It's in underneath the stairs in a, in a Ziploc bag with a sweater that I also put together and a swimming suit that Janie gave me. I have, she has never worn any of it. And I would have just put it in her bin. Right. I didn't, it's not mine, but so he's not even funny. pregnant. But when I went right after they got married, I asked him about having a baby and they're like, oh, we're going to wait a while. But when I mentioned it this time, he wasn't so like, oh, you know, no, in yeah. fact, he was so into it, like accepted it as like, oh yeah, that, that totally makes sense. I mean, he just yeah. fully bought it. And I was like, oh, he must be going to have a baby or has a little girl or something like that. And no, no. Come to find out. Maybe it's coming. Yeah. It's in the yeah. future. I don't oh know. Oh my gosh. Yeah, well, that's, that's super those. exciting. I'm, I'm bummed that I missed them. I had, um, as you know, I was going to try to be there. I had a huge install and um, I was doing it by myself and I was doing a whole bedroom. And of course I get this beautiful headboard and it's wall mounted and looks awesome. And I put the, and I centered it under the window and I put the bed up to the window and I'm like, this bedroom, you can't have this centered underneath this window. There's not enough room on either side. And there's like a dance floor on the other side. So I had to move it. So that just like waylaid me and it was, it was not my day. It was not going well. So I missed out, which I was bummed about, but they seemed really cool. And I'm sure they'll talk to us again. So if you guys haven't checked out their podcast, please do. So it is called we ain't broke, which I love. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're kind of doing a different format where they sort of uncover, um, a phase of their life and the stories about their life each episode. So you kind of don't have their full picture yet. You kind of don't know it. Now you told me though, what had happened to Alex and I don't recall. Let's talk about it. it. So, um, I did mention that you might want to go to theirs. Okay. I'm doing this. Am I looking at you? Uh, well, no, not really. You should be looking Only at because your when, I, when I was looking at their video, yeah, I think I'm looking over at the wall, but I'm not looking. Am I looking in your direction? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll leave it that way then. Um, in the very beginning. So this is terrible. He was on vacation with his family in Mexico at a water park. That's right. Okay. He, he broke his C5, I guess, which is just inches from actually being paralyzed from the neck down. And, um, so he was, he's just, so he has use of his upper body, but he can't use his hands. And I loved the line. Um, I don't mean to ignore what you just said, but I love the line that he said, don't worry. Um, everybody yeah. continued to have a great time that day at yeah. the park. Like, like no one fucking knew like that, that, yeah. that I had just had a life changing disability happen to me, like a, a, a horrific accident. And not, they didn't skip a beat at the park. Which is like, it's sad because how yeah. often it happened that we don't even know. And he's just got such an amazing attitude towards everything that, I, and 
you know, he had said something about Claudia, had a dream about him. And I'm like, because you're still that same person. Like, okay. And who was know, Claudia? I wasn't sure who so, Claudia okay, was. So Claudia is Chase's wife. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Claudia was having dreams about Alex. Yes. And I guess she had this dream about him before she had known he had been in an accident. Okay. Like right before, like what, had he already been in the accident or? Like, I think it had happened. Okay. And, um, she hadn't known it yet, but had the stream about him. Okay. Like, yeah. Wow. So that, I don't know. It's just, it's just, I don't know. They're just really great boys when they could easily be just not doing well. Right. And we call them boys because we're almost 50 and they're in their twenties. And so <laughs> they are actually men, but they um, are, they are. And I don't mean to put them down in that way, but you know, yeah. they're the, like, not much, not much older than my son. So, um, yeah. it's, a, it's a term of endearment guys. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Good kids. Good kids. You want me to do go first? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So in 1928, this, this, the theme of this, let me tell you kind of where my thought process was on this. This one is similar to, um, Michael. Oh my goodness. I should have been prepared with his name. We did a story on him out of, um, Olympia, Washington, um, okay, off okay. of, um, Kenny Slater road. Do you remember that story where, the, where Matthew went missing and he's still missing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how oftentimes people who struggle with drug addiction and, or mental illness don't get the sort of attention from, you know, law professionals and the public and all of that. And, and you don't even hear about these stories. So this happened in 2018 and I have never heard the story and this happened very close to us. And let me just kind of tell you about it. Her name is Sarah Zogol. Z G H O U L. And she worked as a model and actress, and she was also a young mom, but she was found decapitated and dismembered in the trunk of a car in Aloha, Oregon. Yeah. Oh, really? So this is 2018. Did you hear about a woman being decapitated? And okay, me neither. And like, doesn't that seem pretty easy? (laughs) What would you say? Whose car was it? Well, so it is pretty easy. That's the problem. This story um, didn't take long to solve. I still okay. feel like we should have heard about it, but okay. she was 28 years old. And by all accounts, she had really kind of gone into a bad place with drugs and alcohol. And she was addicted and she actually wanted to get help. And I'll tell you about that. But she was trying to get out of it. She was trying to do the right thing by her son, trying to get her life together. She was 28 years old at the time. And when the police um, first were called, they um, found and identified a suspect quickly. Um, When they found him, he was actually attempting to take his own life. And the suspect, his name was Jeremiah Johnston. He was 37 years old and he ended up pleading guilty to first degree murder second degree kidnapping and first degree abuse of a corpse and conspiracy to commit first degree murder of a witness. Okay. Johnston, um, who did this claims that in 2018, while he was at his parents' home, he got really mad at, um, Sarah and she had a big drug debt with him. Apparently he was a drug dealer, a local drug dealer, and he got mad So he says that he slit her throat, dismembered her body, and stashed stashed her remains in the trunk of his BMW. Hmm. I'm like, hmm, well, geez, I think we could have got a little more creative, but all right. (laughs) So in 2019, he was sentenced to life and he'll be eligible for parole in 65 years. Well, so that just kind of, you know, really nice, tidy little bow with that whole story. But the question I started wondering was, how did this happen to her? Why didn't I hear about it? how did she get to this place? So, um, she comes from a self-proclaimed tight knit family. Um, her mother, father, and sister, she lived with them all. And they were Jordanian Americans of the Muslim faith. And she had really struggled with that addiction. Like I said, and she was on both meth and heroin. And she actually told her mom, um, 
you know what, I'm ready. I want to go to inpatient treatment. You know, will you take me? And so her mother says that she drove her to Providence St. Vincent Medical Center. And um, later that day, Sarah called and said, hey, the hospital didn't have room for me. And um, I'm going to go tomorrow, but I need you to come pick me up. And which I am a little suspicious that that was the truth. I think if I was the mom, I probably would have called and said, what's going on? What's the deal? But um, Sarah said that she would try a different location the next day. So her mom came and she picked her up and she checked her into a hotel in Beaverton. Now, I don't understand the family dynamics. So, I mean, I think we can judge a lot about her dropping her off and paying for a hotel room, but I think we all need to realize that sometimes having people with drug addictions and, and that is not always healthy to have them in the house. And so to bring her home, what did that mean? What did that mean for the son? Um, cause her son, I think was six at the time. So I I'm not judging that at all. I'm just thinking, you know, there's a lot of really hardships at this point and you're kind of depending on how many times she's done this, you could be at your, you know, the end of your rope or whatever. So she ends up buying a hotel room for the night and checking her in in Beaverton. Well, Sarah got antsy after her mom left and she contacted Johnston and Johnston came and picked her up from the hotel. And he actually took her back to his parents' house, which is a couple blocks from Sarah's own family home in Aloha. And, um, so he was like, she was like a half mile away from her parents at this point. And this is where Johnston claims that, um, she said she didn't plan on repaying him what she already owed him. And he says that he became enraged. He says that he bound her to a chair with duct tape. Then he released her. Sarah decided to escape, but he caught her and threw her down a set of flight of stairs, which she struck her head on the wall. Then he says this injury caused her to vomit and she asked if she could shower and Johnston agreed. And then while she was in the shower, he says that he got this plan to kill her. He went to retrieve a knife and returned to the basement where he tried, he tied her hands up after she got out of the shower, uh, climbed on top of her and slit her throat. Um, Other reports actually say that he tried to bribe another drug dealer and, um, Oh, sorry. Bribe another drug dealer with her in order to rob that other drug dealer. So she, he said to her, um, Hey, you help me get this other drug dealers money and I'll let you go. And she refused to do that and tried to escape. So that's, that's the two different conflicting stories. But then he says that he, after he killed her, that then he decided to sleep and clear his head. Eventually he, um, ends up waking up and saying, oh my God, what have I done? And I need to dismember her. So he dismembered her body, stuffed it into trash bags and an oversized bear he had bought at a local drugstore. Yeah. Then he put her in the bags and the bear and, um, put them into the BMW. He moved the car away from the house. And during this, he even texted her mother impersonating Sarah, telling the mom that she had changed her mind. She wasn't going to go to rehab and instead she was going to go on a trip and don't worry, I'm going to be okay. I'm fine. I'm just going to be away for a while. Well, then he confided in a friend that he was asking help for, he was asking another friend for help and confided in this person. Well, this person, um, actually uh, told police, but the friend says that he told him that he had killed this drug addict and that nobody would miss her. Um, but the friend refused and said, you know, I'm not going to help you. Sorry. And he called police and, um, helped the police find, um, the car with the remains police, uh, at this point didn't have enough evidence, which I'm like, well, open the fucking car. And I think you'll have enough evidence. Um, so they ended up stalking him and kind of doing a stakeout. And eventually um, Johnston returned to move his car again and police followed him this time. Well, he stopped at a local Safeway and bought a knife. And then meanwhile, this is interesting because I'm like, how long does it take you to go into Safeway and get a knife? Because meanwhile, police brought a dog to the scene 
So I'm like, well, how long does that take to get a dog to the scene? Unless you've already got a dog on the scene. But so yeah. I didn't dig into all of like <laughs> that, that stuff, but I was like, what, how long does that take? How long does getting a knife at Safeway take? Um, and the dog indeed identified the presence of human remains. So they got a search warrant and they found her remains in the back of the car. Um, but they, Johnston in the, to get a search warrant. Well, thank you. This, these were all the questions I had. I was yeah. like, what? Like, were we already in the process of getting those things? Like a dog they had to have been on its in. way. Like one little trip into Safeway. Yeah. That's like 10 minutes max. Yeah. Right. Well, I guess Johnston must've seen the police, uh, working up the car because he came out of Safeway and actually, do you know, Murray Hills? where that Safeway is. I think this all happened over at Murray Hill, um, where that Safeway is kind of up on the hill. Yeah. And they later found him in a wooded area nearby with injuries to his neck from the knife he purchased at Safeway. And all of this information came from, well, most of this information came from Oregon Live, right, written by Noel Crombie. Um, and then while in Washington County, he tried to hire an inmate to kill a witness for the prosecution on his trial. He should have just like lived with that, with that debt, right? Because now not only is she dead, but he's in life forever. Forever. Because somebody owed some money from drugs. Like, yes. And I don't know about you. I listen to the story and I go, he is full of shit. That's not I how it he happened. He threw her down the stairs and she got a concussion so bad that she threw up and then he's like i gotta do something now she's gonna Here, turn me in you know because my he thing to the hospital then he's toast or whatever here was my thing yeah she probably had no money her mom didn't leave her money she probably was desperate and she called him because she wanted drugs and she probably before she's going back tomorrow exactly she yeah. probably said hey i'll give you sex in exchange for drugs and then maybe she got back to the house or maybe she thought she was going to get drugs from him without sex. And then he was like, no, no, you're going to give me sex. And she was not wanting part of that. The whole shower thing, his story, it didn't make sense. Um, I feel like there was more going on to that story. I would bet she's gorgeous. If you look her up, she's beautiful. Um, but I think he was, He's not copying to what he really did to her. I'm sure she was in pure hell and torture for a good several hours. Especially if he wakes he up and he's like, what did I do? And why do you take him home? Why do you take her home? Why wouldn't you have stayed in the hotel? Totally. That's weird. Yes. Plus, you can't tell me he didn't have drugs on him at the same time. But yeah. I guess the reason I tell you that story is that a lot of really bad things happen and a lot of people get hurt. And, um, I do find it interesting that the system, the social ladder, we don't hear about those cases, you know, had she been, um, not a drug user and not struggling for sobriety, we probably would have heard about her. Um, and that's, to me is sad. I don't want to put race in the middle of it because I think that's irrelevant in this case, but I do think that there's a lot of people that go missing yeah. that aren't looked for ultimately. Um, and a lot of feeling of, well, we're not going to waste our time on that case because, you know, that person wasn't in a good place. Yeah. And I, I find that sad because that guy is clearly messed up. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, um, we have a listener, Rhonda, brought us attention to us. Rhonda brought a case to us that she thought maybe we would be able to talk about a little bit. Hello, and, Rhonda. Yes, Rhonda. And she linked in a another person's podcast. And this lady's name is Gwen Beringer. I think that's how you say it. And her podcast is A Light for Erica. There's only two episodes on it. And um, it was really interesting because this Gwen lady, she mentions for every, you know, 13 cases, there's one that actually you hear about. And mm -hmm. she says 10, but to me, I feel like there's probably more than every 10 you hear about one. So she used the example, uh, Maura Murray. You know, mm -hmm. everybody's heard of Maura Murray, but there's also a number of other ones that we haven't heard of. Um, 
that go unheard because of certain things like mental illness or drug addiction, or maybe they're just somebody that's in a small town that doesn't have a huge network of people that um, know enough people to get the word out, you know? Right. So this is a story about her name was, because I don't even have my glasses on, so this is going to be hard. <laughs> this lady who went missing is Erica Hogue, and she went missing on May 17, 2018, and uh, she went missing from Selma, Oregon. You know what? Yeah, I mean? which I saw that. Where the heck is Selma, Oregon? I have no idea. <laughs> I heard Grants Pass, but I heard three hours from Bend. I don't know. Okay, I'll look that up while you. Okay. And she went missing from the 7800 block, block of Deer Creek Road. Now, so Erica used to have a family, and in her mid 30s, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And so she lost custody of her children and lost her marriage. And in that time, I believe is when she is moved, lived to Selma, Oregon, from what it sounds like from Gwen's podcast, A Light for Erica. And so she had a few boyfriends and um, there was one who was the last person to have seen her. His name was called uh, Larry Anthony Hopkins, AKA Hannibal. Ah, no. Yes. And according okay, pause, uh, pause. Um, yes. this is near Grants Pass, Oregon. So yes. you're right. It's in Southern Oregon, near Grants Pass and the Rogue yes. River. And according to Gwen in the podcast, this area is full of vineyards and pot farms. And so um they actually call uh the people that work in these part pot, pot pot farms uh trimigrants. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. so she was probably working at different pot farms. Was she working at those? Because I've read or I've seen documentaries about those pot farms and the shit goes that goes on there. Um, it kind of sounds like that's pretty much what people do there. Oh, and she also was um known to maybe have been a part of a um, I don't know if you want to call it a cult. I guess you could call it one, but it's called the Rainbow Family of Love and Light. Oh, she's okay. kind of part of that and yeah. it sounds like from these this this area is not pot farms but like they said um like long-haired women loose women basically they're just um not the greatest people of that area and that is coming from her boyfriend mm. he was the last to have seen her so right after so may 17th so hannibal was, let's let me get this straight yes. hannibal was the last person to see her. Okay. Okay. Yes. So okay. Hannibal is the last person to see her. He says that the day, the last day he had seen her, she was upset because it was about a week after Mother's Day. So this is May 17th. So Mother's Day is around that first week or so of May. And she was upset for not seeing her kids and not being able to get a hold of them, which then spiraled basically her mental illness. And so she wasn't sleeping. And if you don't sleep when you have mental illness, things get worse. And um, it sounded like she was having a hard time sleeping. She was all over the place. Um, she was known, and according to him on this day in particular, was walking around uh, the, um, I guess he lives- Grounds. Yeah, the grounds. He, she was walking around naked, which according to her sister is not unheard of. She was that type of person. And so that wasn't totally weird other than, um, uh, you know, his story doesn't always kind of match what after time, it doesn't seem to go together. Wait, uh, Hannibal's story didn't, Hannibal's story, didn't, yeah. he didn't keep the same story every time police talk to him. It changes a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and some of the things, um, that we'll I'll talk about in just a minute kind of don't match either but let's just say you know the Hannibal is not quite the greatest person but he but trustworthy I don't know. yeah I don't know I mean I don't want to say like all pop people are gross and they're you know mischievous or whatever but um there was something weird going on and she um so she was having a hard time he said the last time he saw her she was actually laying down crying in bed but she was excited because she hadn't slept and that's the one thing that actually kind of makes you a little bit better 
is right. some sleep. And so he said he, he kept going back, I think to the neighbors or to the farm next door, probably to trim pot or whatever. Okay. And, um, or whatever they do, <laughs> whatever he does. And, um, and he'd come back and check on her. And so she, last time he said he saw her, she was in bed crying. Then he leaves again, comes back and she's gone. Okay. Then um, I don't know how. What much- did they live in? Did they live in a house or a mobile home or did they live on the it grounds of the pot farm? Say. Okay. Say. He just said she wasn't there. Okay. And um, apparently, according to her sister, she always, always carried this handmade bong. And even when she would get arrested, they would give it back to her because it was legal to have. But it was made out of a Gatorade bottle. And then she always had a lighter on her lanyard. So this is somebody who smoked pot a lot. So she was and naked, but always had a homemade Gatorade bong? She, she said it was like her baby. She always had okay. her bong with her. Okay. And, 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 yeah. and this lanyard lighter. Okay. And this lanyard lighter. Well, mm-hmm. it was a few months later, they found it in like some area near his house like I think he was looking on the property and he had found it and his sister the sister was like that would have never been left behind and um the sister also knew when he called to see and talk to check in or whether with the sister um she knew something was wrong almost immediately it wasn't uncommon for her to go missing but she goes this time it was just different it was she just knew something was wrong and so what he said is she had mentioned going to Ben to be with her kids. So when he thought when she wasn't there that maybe she had gone to Ben. And um, so even though he was worried, he wasn't too worried, but he was, you know, but she's also spiraling out of control with her mental illness. And um, the other weird thing was it was three months after um, she goes missing there's this, uh, it sounded like maybe a Facebook message conversation, or it could have been text message and conversation. So Gwen, um, the person who did this other podcast, she was digging around and she's trying to find Penny Peel that knew people to, to validate some of the story. And in doing that, she was contacted by somebody who said, oh, I have an interesting text message conversation that you might want to see. So she was able to get screenshots of this text message information that involved this Hannibal guy with this other girl. And he's basically asking her, are you going to come to town? And she's like, well, I'm going to try. And then he mentions his missing girlfriend and how hard it's been and how that she was just gone one day. And um, he doesn't mention the naked part and he just mentions that the last time she had he had seen her, she was in the bed that crying. So it didn't really match completely with what was told to the sister, um, but it wasn't too far off. So um, did police investigate this at all, or is it just the sister and this Gwen gal that's? Well, it it sounds like they have, but it's just cold now. Like there's there's no information, um, and a lot of these little towns they just don't go she, and. This the Gwyn girl is saying I, she's been to this area. She's from that area, I, I believe, and um, she's like it's like dense woods. Like you could easily yeah. hide somebody, yeah. and she is very much like she feels like this Hannibal guy's character. He's acting really kind of weird, you know, suspicious. And then I'm thinking, well, you know, if he didn't do anything, he probably would want some other girl to come and visit him, you know, even if it wasn't for a relationship, you know, he was trying to get her to come. To me, I I didn't feel like that was so like he was guilty of doing something. It just meant he was wanting some companionship, but he was also warning her, hey, the people here aren't the greatest people. Like just to- Is that the way he kind of said it? Yeah. Um, Yeah, you would have to listen to her podcast uh, and they were one year apart. There's only two episodes. Oh, um, okay. She's actually really good. She's like, I've never done this before. She's super honest. And yeah. and now she cut, is doing, she wants to do more cases and things, but um, there just wasn't a ton of information. She, this woman used to have like sleek blonde hair and it went, now she's got, well, the last time she was seen had dreadlocks and they were um, colored in like, rainbow colors and because she's part of the rainbow family of love and light but yeah. she's five six between 100 and 100 and 130 pounds um 
like she won't have her bone with her. Was one thing you would always, oh yes, she does have a tattoo. She okay. has it on her right bicep. It's a pot leaf. <laughs> of course. That should be pretty obvious. So if you think you know somebody and I'll put a picture of her on the website too. And I'll, make, I'll even link the, the podcast that goes to it. And thanks to Rhonda for bringing us this case. But um, she's just one of those people that I don't think a lot of people are looking for either because she has had drug use. She has mental illness. She yeah. could easily be anywhere. But it, I think a lot of the family, including the sister, don't believe that she's here any longer. Yeah. So. Well, I, I don't know a lot about this and I obviously didn't know you were doing this story today, so I didn't prepare anything, but, um, I have watched some documentaries on these pot trimming farms and they're really, um, they're really sketchy. Uh, the ones that I watched were along the Crescent city, uh, Eureka area. And basically they're very isolated. Um, first of all, these areas are typically over, um, on the West, almost to the beach. Right. And, um, they're in usually secluded wooded areas that a lot of law enforcement aren't bugging them because it is legal, but it's not really legal. And it's kind of this fine line. And they have a lot of drifters that come in and cut. And um, I know one of the guys that they followed on this documentary, he had a lot of women um, because women were really good at it. They were really good. And the men would go out and like bring it all in and then the women would dry it and trim it. And I want to say that even um, one of them, they had to strip down so that they could they could tell they weren't stealing it. And maybe I'm merging that with some other cocaine movie. Cause I feel like they did that in a <laughs> cocaine movie where the women were all naked because they were uh, like splitting up cocaine and they had to be naked to show that they weren't, you know, stealing it or whatever. Um, so I could be blending those th two things together, but it seems as though they're really left alone to sort of what happens here stays here kind of an attitude and police, I know they have a bunch of um, like things set up so they will know if somebody's coming and if police are coming, they have lookout people and all of that, like raids. And so it's kind of like this little community that starts building and, but there's a lot of people in and out, you know, yeah. like so-and-so. It sounds like a vagabond type it of is. style where they make enough money to go to the next town and then they, exactly they just to make you know, just to have, and they, they work enough to have, they get food and whatever. And then they smoke a little pot, you know, they have a little fun and then they may move on they may stay there for a while. It seemed like one of them that I watched in the back of my head, it, it seemed like he had his posse of women and Lord knows what's going on there, but, um, it is a very free lifestyle. I think that whole, that whole, um, I guess it's a, it's really a perpetuated, theme of, you know, potheads unite kind of a thing where love and peace and all that kind of stuff of the sixties, that kind of seems to sort of a little bit go on there, but it's got this edgy side because they are, you know, it's still federally illegal, right? So they could be federally rated. And so I think that, um, it just sounds a little sketch. Um, and the funny thing is like those types of people, probably know exactly where all these farms are, where if you and Correct. I try to, we wouldn't even know where to go to start. Like, I wouldn't even know where to find drugs if I was. Well, as I recall, what happened to one of the people in this documentary is they had stopped in Crescent City or Eureka, one of those, and said, hey, can I get a job somewhere? You know, start talking to the townspeople. And the townspeople, like, you know, she clearly was interested in pot or whatever. And then somebody says, oh, well, there's a tr trimming place up here, you know? And so she went up there to get a job. It was, it's kind of like through word of mouth, everybody yeah. in town knows they're there, but they just sort of like, if you guys be good, we'll just leave you alone and not we worry. We don't really it. want you in the town. So could you go over there? Yeah. 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 It's so, just well, because like you said, like everybody's life is worth something. And yeah. even if it wasn't one that we felt that was the greatest or wasn't contributing, doesn't mean it wasn't worth something to a family member or just in general. So it'd be nice to, I don't know, everybody's worth something. Well, and I think, you know, this kind of ties back into last, last week's story, but, um, you know, Chase obviously had a mother and a father 
Um, and both of them are gone. And now he calls himself an orphan. Mm -hmm. And I could hear in you when you were sharing these stories of his mom, you had such joy and memory of them. And it makes me want to kind of tear up because you were excited. Yeah. Not all of it, like about the boyfriend and stuff, but I could tell he was like, give me more, give me more. He didn't say that. Right. But I could tell he was like lapping those things up. And probably if you could sit down with him and tell him all these stories about his mom, he would just be elated. It would make his heart. Uh, but there's hurt. a lot of it that he doesn't know that yes. is that would, it would explain some of the stuff because did you hear the part where, um, you know, I asked him, did you know that your mom had also been abused? And he yes. had no idea. He didn't. He has no idea. No. And coming. he, and like, he did say he suspected yes. now, and now as an adult, he oh can see gosh. that. Like, and right? I just wanted to tell him like, Bleh, and just tell yeah. them all because there was a very significant event that happened. Yeah. But I want him to ask because I don't feel like I, uh, I don't want to just throw up all this information on him. He has to be ready for it. Yeah. And I mean, so when I told him, I'm like, I get what she did. Yeah, I understand it. And, and to sort of circle back to the story that you just told, I think, you know, she has kids that want to hear yeah. those stories and yeah. she mattered to them. Yes. Even if she didn't matter on a daily basis in their life, they knew their mom was over here, whether she was struggling or whatever, they, they, they still have a connection to her. They, they probably dreamed of eventually her being more in their life. Right. And so it is sad when we, as a society choose which lives are important and which ones aren't and which ones we should search for and which ones we don't. And I and think honestly, she had mental illness and that's probably what brought her to the drugs. Like, correct. And, and for these kids to not even, and those kids also could be facing those same yeah. things yeah. later, yeah. but for them not to even understand, they're just going to think that she was gone and they right. won't have these stories and know exactly what had happened. Yes. That's sad. Yeah. And I don't even know how old they were. They may be too young to really remember their mom much longer. You know, I, I don't know what their age were, was, but, um, you know, some younger kids under four or whatever, they don't really have memories of under four. So, they and just then they get sparser one day Yeah, and never came back. Yeah. yeah. But like, it, it might not have been because she chose to. Right. So interesting that we both have stories that didn't get a lot of media coverage Yeah. that, um, girls that women that maybe didn't have the most perfect lives. Um, you know, and I don't know how, what was your gal's name? Not Gail. Erica Hogue. Erica, Erica, what kind of family she came from, but you know, Sarah, it seems like she came from a good family and, and you know, those things happen in good families just as well as families that are broken. Yeah. So there is no recipe. There is no a plus B equals C. Well, and especially like with COVID right now, right? Like we, yeah. I think especially with people, even if we don't have like a diagnosed mental illness, we could yeah. easily fall into depression during these times. And it doesn't take much to send a Christmas card or to reach out to somebody. And even if you have a friend who's known to be depressed and it may be a difficult conversation because it may not be a positive one, but just reaching out may mean a lot to somebody else. Yeah. So I think it's important during, especially it's the holidays, like just take a couple of minutes to just reach out to a few people every day, just yeah. to let them know that you, they still matter. Well, and I don't know about you, but just to that point, um, my heart goes out to everybody right now, because I had a hard week last week. It was very difficult for me to feel positive right now in these COVID times. I'm just so tired after nine months. I feel like I've been locked down since March 14th and, um, I'm just exhausted. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of listening to the news. I'm tired of hearing that, you know, a hundred thousand vaccines we, we turned away and <laughs> just over it, like, just let's get back to normal. And, uh, you know, that, that isn't the reality right now. So I, I do agree with you. Um, especially those people that are living alone that don't have a lot of family nearby. Um, yeah. If you can do something kind for someone, um, that means the world to people just those well, little I think, things. Like I have a couple of clients that I had one specific, like specifically last week and, um, she seemed really sad. Like she 
seemed she really wants like a significant person in her life and she doesn't have one and you can't find one now and no. she is just lonely so lonely and um we were going to make a little gift and just put it by your door. I'm just, I'm not even going to tell her who it's from or anything. Good. good. Because I, I just wanted to know that somebody out there thinks you're special enough that to leave something by your door. And, um, and I've done that a couple of times, but I just don't want, I don't even want the recognition. I just want, I just want people to know that people care and that we're yeah. still around. And it might be even better if you don't know who it was, right? right. Like, yeah. let them wonder. I have a secret in my ear out there. Like, I love that. Just, just, it's just hard. And I think that's another thing. Like, realistically, we may not be going back to school in September. Like, right. We may be like, maybe it's hybrid or, I mean, I don't know. It just really depends. And so adding a puppy, even though it is like probably the last thing we need right now, we have time and yeah. there's four children in this house who could go outside with this puppy, yeah. even though we already have a dog, but yeah. Um, I just think like, this is probably the perfect time to get another dog. And, um, it actually you just reminded me of like a little neighbor up the street. I really need to drop something off at her house. Aww. Now that you said that she's super cool. She loves aliens. Ooh. I asked her to be on the podcast. She didn't want to be on it. She's like 93. <laughs> what? Why didn't she want to be? Oh, uh, I don't even know. She knows what a podcast is, but, no. um, my mom's I listening now, Leslie. Oh, good. Hi, mom. mom yes. Um. So John Warther and I yes. are going to start when this is all over. We're going to start doing ghost hunting. Oh. If you want to be a part of that, um, we are starting to collect our equipment. Oh. So he's bought some. I've bought some, and together we'll have a significant a bunch of equipment. Okay. And um. So if he goes by himself, he can borrow my stuff or vice versa, or we have extra stuff. And so I got him a couple of little things for Christmas, um, for, for his toolkit. And, um, it's just kind of funny. And I said, where do you want to go first? He's like my house. Cause I had some activity. I haven't had anything since I've told you, you haven't? but now I've got something I could, uh, record with. I might as well try, but I haven't had anything recently. So I don't know what happened. It left already. Anyway, so maybe that's you need, exciting. Maybe you need to ask for it to come back. Maybe we're going to start rearranging this room again. So maybe. You are know. you in your bedroom? Where are you? No, I'm in the playroom. Um, this is the room that has the, both of the grandparents and Ozzy's ashes in it. And we have oh, a lot yeah. of Larry's belongings here. Okay. And Larry was Michael's cousin who was murdered. Yeah. So a lot of his things are in here. And I feel like. Um, or it could have been my dad. I don't know. Who knows who it was? Yeah. It could be all of them. I know. Anyway, I thought also the the story of with it, you were talking to Chase and Alex about you saying that you felt like you were an orphan, even though you had both parents. Yes, I so thought I've never thing because you know Alex has great parents, and then he he is an orphan. Well, then you have somebody who has parents but still feels like one. Right? Yeah. So it's just, everyone's families can be messy. I thought that was interesting. I've never heard you talk about it in that way. Yeah. I mean, I knew you didn't feel particularly close to your mom, that you always felt like you were just a burden or an afterthought for her. Um, and that you felt closer to your dad, but that you didn't either of them, that you didn't have this super strong connection with. I, I totally get that. Um, but I didn't know that you felt like an orphan. I thought you maybe just felt like a misfit, like different from them. I don't think either one of them. So my, I never lived with my dad. I remember writing him a letter and handing it to him saying how much I wanted to live at his house. Oh. And then never talked about it, nothing. And then, but my mom was never home because like, okay, she had me when she was 30 then they get divorced. So she's like in her mid thirties, right? Single, yeah. Ready to mingle. Yeah. And then you have a kid, but then you have a, a daughter, an older daughter who can take care of the take little care one. of her. So then when she wouldn't get home till 11 o'clock, I would be in bed when she would come home. Yeah. Like I didn't, um, I never saw her. I didn't know her. Yeah. Right. So even though I had two parents, neither right. one of them really wanted to invest any time or energy in me. 
And does your, does your sister resent you for having to take care of you? Uh, so we used to play this game called me, mommy, me and mama. Oh, and basically the game was, um, I would have to do whatever she said, or I got the <laughs> shit beat out of me. For so that's real? Got her chores done. But then I was so fearful that she might actually do something. I just did them all. So then she wouldn't get in trouble because I never got in trouble for anything. She was the one that got in trouble. But, you know, she was seven years older than me, put on this huge responsibility of a little sister. So, I mean, the whole thing's messed up. And I mean, I don't know. I have a lot of my my own kids and I'm trying to do the opposite or just learning from what I experienced or what I didn't want for my own. And. I do find myself following, falling into some of the same patterns, not even consciously. Right. But it's like, okay, I got to stop doing that. Like, you know. Yeah. But well, and, and you've turned out great. I mean, I think you're a w- amazing mom. I think you have just done a Trust fabulous me, job. My kids are going to blame me for something later too. Oh, for sure. Right. But you know what? That's why you say, you know what? When you're 27, you can go to therapy just like the rest of us. Right. I mean, yeah, there's just no way. At one point, my son said, you know, you just made me feel like I was the smartest person in the world. And then I got to, you know, college and realized I wasn't. I'm like, oh, some people have the worst problems. (laughs) Well, that's why I was trying to tell Chase, like, you know, you know, your mom is just an older version of us. Yeah. Like we might just have a little bit more experiences, but we still don't know everything. And we have to act like we have it all together, but we're just like winging it as we go. Right. So So when are you going to tell people the rest of the story about Janie? um, I'm kind of waiting for him to um, tell his version. I feel like he, it's his story and he should say, and go to more detail first and then we'll we can talk about all that I okay. mean the people who really know me know what had happened right um and I feel like when he's ready he can reach out to me and I can um disclose more information that would make more sense for him yeah. and I mean there are some very significant things that I think would be very helpful for him to know uh, just in the ways that it might make sense of yeah. what certain things happened and um, and I did tell him, and I don't know if I mentioned it at the last one, but that she had lost young life because of him Yeah, because the house was unsafe. And yeah. that was such a huge part of her. I don't think he knew that. Yeah, no, we, he didn't. And that had nothing to do with the stepdad beating them. Yeah. That was because he was beating her. Yeah. So it, she was a young life leader. Yeah. Okay. And a young life leader to high school girls. Well, she only had boys. So they would all powwow in her living room. And Jenny was the type that, you know, lipstick, colored hair, you know, like bleach blonde and all the fun foo-foo stuff. And, um, and was just this really great person. So everybody looked up to her. And that must mean that something happened while those girls were there. That happened while I was there, but there was an incident that a major one that I don't believe he knows about that but but how did young life find out then it was a legal matter oh yeah okay yeah and you know maybe later on we can talk about that more because i don't want to share it on here because he doesn't even know it yet yeah yeah you don't think he knows it at all huh No, no because he said he even said um because the dog's behavior started changing yeah and um because he didn't know that his mom was being beaten. He had suspicions. I know he doesn't know about this. Yeah. 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 Okay. Anyway. All right. Well, um, they were great and I hope to talk with them some point and that, um, the story about the water park is just sad too. Yeah. Um, I do want to mention that I'm going to be meeting with John, whether you can come or not, it doesn't matter to me, but we are going to talk about our ghost uh, hunting equipment. And, um, Hopefully he knows how it works. I have no idea how things work. So <laughs> okay. um, we're going to talk about that. And I'm going to put it on the Patreon. Okay. And so we do have a few episodes that are on Patreon or Patreon, depending on which way, which if you go to our website or if you actually go to Patreon um, for like a $3 pledge, there's a few other stories that aren't just out for the public that they can listen to, including some of the, the our ghost equipment that we're going to put on and probably some of our ghost hunting recap stories will also be going on there as well. 
Um, I also recorded with Michelle Warther about um, some internet stuff about how everything's kind of connected and how it really freaked out one of my clients. And so I did a little, I haven't even edited it yet, but I will be putting that on as well. Okay. But so for $3 a month, you can log in and listen to some episodes that we haven't put out there. And including Melissa was going to record a few and then send them to me. And then I'm yeah. going to put that on there. So there yeah. will be more content and it, for $3, you can help support us. It's not a big deal, but um, it would be very helpful. Everybody take care, be good to each other, be kind to each and every one of your friends and family and the people that you come in contact with people at the store, yes. be kind, be, be yeah. generous. We have, we have nothing but time. So just yeah. don't be in a hurry for anything. Yeah. 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 Well, love you less. Bye, Melissa. Thank you. Bye, honey.